happy Saturday and welcome back to the Suitability Saturday podcast. I am your host, Elizabeth Como, an attorney who represents incarcerated persons at their parole suitability hearings in California. This week, I have two very special guests, Sean and Daryl, who were recently released from prison after being granted parole. They are going to provide a very brief overview of how they ended up in prison, how they found the courage to change, how they navigated through their rehabilitation journey, and a brief glimpse at what it takes to be found suitable for parole. They will also share a surprising revelation about whether or not there is anything they miss about being in prison. Stay tuned for a great discussion with two amazing men who found freedom by being willing to think about life from an entirely new perspective. We hope you enjoy the conversation we had. We're going to jump right into the interview. Good morning, everyone. My name is Daryl. I was convicted of second degree murder in 1989. I completed 33 years of prison and I was released in September of this year. It was a tremendous ordeal, a very long process. It necessitated many, many hours in rehabilitation and the parole board found me suitable. Um, and since then, I've been trying to lead proactive, live a post-social life, and get things in order. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking about opening and honestly about any and everything that comes across anyone's mind to assist and help anyone in society in understanding our process and going through understanding the things that we've had to go through in order to become rehabilitated and released. How long did it take you? I was just curious. How long did it take you to get granted parole? I first went. I went to the parole board a number of eight times. I could have been released earlier, but I didn't have my things in order. I learned in 2017 that not understanding who I was at the time of the commission of the crime, not understanding my character defects, causal factors, not having adequate insight prevented me from getting released. So it took me 21 years. Wow. 21 years. Wow. That's impressive. But that's good. Not to mention, the parole board wasn't really granting parole up until 2010. So not that that's an excuse. But how about you, Sean? I went to prison in 1994. I committed a homicide, a murder. By 2013, a lady by, by the name of Dr. Barber had seen something in me and pulled me to the side. She said she's seen that I can be a, a, a positive role model to the people in prison. And so I had another older gentleman who had spent 34 years in prison already who pulled me to the side also. That kind of sparked an interest in me and to want to change. And then dealing with my daughter and family members, my mother, I kind of wanted something different but didn't know how. And so I started going to the groups, uh, getting laughed at by associates on the yard. But my courage still took me in there regardless because there was something in me, that fire in me, there was something in me that wanted to change. But I, did, I just didn't know how, and I didn't really know if I had the courage to change because of the peer pressure of the friends in, that I was incarcerated, formerly incarcerated with. But I went, I would have to say my, my religious belief helped me also. And so about 2013 is when I really started taking it seriously. But Everything wasn't, didn't leave overnight. So I was still engaging in a little bit of criminal activity, but not as much as I, I, I used to, right? And so I was changing gradually. That allowed people to go back to board sooner, which my board day went to 2032. And so I went in 2018, got a five-year denial. We went, I went back in 2021, uh, June 8th, got released in September, and I'm free now. And how do you get that courage? Because there's that there's that turning point, right? Where it's you have no courage to do it. You have no courage and you have no desire. And then you have desire and no courage. And how do you finally get the courage to, like you said, be able to withstand all the, the ridicule and the name calling? Being a game member at a young age was the biggest thing for me. And I learned that it took so much courage to become a part of a game to disassociate with my family to the point that we do, 
when you when you come into the into the prison and you're alone and you get tired of being tired, you have to tap in to that same source that you use, that courage that you use to disassociate from your family and to become a criminal. You got to use that same force, turn back to your family, turn back to being a law-abiding citizen and have just complete disregard for the people who you know were not good associates for you. Because we know that poor associates makes poor decisions easy. So I learned if I deal with good associates, then good decisions will be easy. And the, the same desire, same strength I used to do negative, I used it for a positive. I didn't care what no one said about me anymore because it doesn't matter. I, didn't, I wasn't worried about losing people who I knew were not good for me in my life and for my development. And they certainly were not going to love me the way my family, who stood by my side, loved me. So once I came to grips with that, the courage was there. And now it was just about jumping into that courage bucket and roll and, 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 being, and, and pouring it on everything I touched. So it was difficult. However, um, when you look at it in the light of I did it before, I'm just going to do it in a different direction. It becomes a lot easier. And for families, they need to articulate to their loved ones, use that same energy that you use for negative to be positive. You are already cursed. You're already courageous. You went against the grain. So now be courageous to go with the grain. How about you, Sean, in the terms of courage and the progression? Well, for, well, for me, I was sitting in a hole doing a nine month shoot term and I had some uh, some older gentleman who was uh, giving me wisdom. And so one of the things they told me was, no matter what I do, people are gonna talk bad about me, not be satisfied with what I do. So I needed to make a decision on what I wanted in life. And so I just had this fire in me that wanted to change. And like I said, I didn't have the information on how to change, right? And so as, 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 as Duro said, that same energy that I used to be this, this gang member, this drug dealer, this criminal, right? I just took that energy and put it into being a positive individual. But at the same time, I started learning through other people to start surrounding myself around people who was going in the same direction as me. And so um, it didn't bother me as time went on about people laughing because what eventually happened is they started coming to me and asking me for uh, uh, wisdom about how to do this and how to do that. And so with that, when that started happening, that really kind of set a fire under me to saying, okay, I am doing the right thing. Okay, yeah, I'm being talked about a little bit, but that's okay. Because I was being talked about a little bit when I was in the lifestyle. That really encouraged me. And so that's the route that I went. And also my spiritual beliefs. I, I can't speak for anyone else, but my spiritual beliefs and me leaning on my higher power uh, helped me through everything in prison. And so with that, I surrounded myself around people. So the same thing Daryl says, I just recommend that the family just tell them to use that same energy that they have for negativity, for positivity, and to surround themselves around people who is going in the same direction. Go ask questions. It's okay, right? Because people are going to talk. You can't change that. But what you can change is you. That's where I went with mine. What was the one thing that made it difficult for you to give up the old Sean and move to the new Sean? It was my thinking. And so I had this gang mentality way of thinking. And so um, with that, it came a lot of things when it came to my thinking. Like if someone said something to me, I had to respond. If someone did something to me, I had to respond. But when I say respond, I mean respond in, in violence. Right in an aggressive, negative manner. Um, my thinking, as in, I can drink and be still be okay. You know, I can still associate with a few gang member friends and be okay. But I realize that 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 doesn't work, right? Because oil and water don't mix. I realize that me being around certain people, me having a certain way of thinking, because being around these certain people, they still thought criminal activities, right? And so you can't try to think positive and, and, and like society thinks and still hang around criminals because then when you have an issue, so say I had an issue with somebody on the yard and I go talk to him about it, I will talk to Daryl. Hey, Daryl, man, this dude said something crazy to me, man. 
my my old lifestyle would say, well, let's go jump him. Let's go stab him. Well, let's go do this. Daryl would say, well, brother, he might have been having a bad day. Or don't take it so personal. And so he would talk me out of going into my old lifestyle. And so that's some of the things that I learned that was hard because from nine years old, as me and Daryl said, we started at a young age as gang members. And so that was embedded in us. Like we were taught, don't let nobody disrespect you. Don't let nobody talk to you any kind of way. Don't let nobody do this, right? Because they're going to think you're a punk and then they're going to run over you. When I come to find out, nobody's going to think that. They might, you might have a few people that might say, oh, he let dude get away with that. But so what? That doesn't matter. But then they off to something else when they see another incident happen. They're not even thinking about me. And so that was some of the things that helped me out. The criminal lifestyle, regardless whether you're a gang member or a drug dealer, whatever, once you start associating with those small circles, you develop what we learn to be flawed thinking. And the first thing in flawed thinking is the negative self-concept of yourself to where we develop a, a, a very negative image that anyone who says anything about us bad is bad. Anyone who has a negative opinion about us is, is right. So we start making ourselves become adversaries to any and everybody. And then we have this egocentric image of ourselves, self-image of ourselves to where we're bigger than any and everything and anything that comes our way we don't like, we destroy it. So uh, as Sean just mentioned, you know, living like this for so long, you have to come to grips with just because someone said something negative or think negative, you're, it doesn't mean that it's true because we think highly of ourselves now. And also, uh, just because someone does something that's counterproductive towards what we represented or thought was a reality, because it was just a thought, it wasn't real, the whole game mentality is not real, then it's okay to, to allow people to just have their own opinion and live their own lives. So this was, once we came to grips with that, and now we can start looking at things from a, from a, from a, from a different perspective. And when we start es establishing these coping skills, and I just tell Sean all the time, you know, we're not, we, we, we're not gonna take that person. They don't really mean what they say. You know, they only wanna test us. We gave people 70 excuses for what they did every single day so that we could be better people. Sometimes we just made up an excuse for the, for, the, for the people. You know, they don't know what they're getting themselves into. They don't really wanna do this, you know, or when you have people who really wanna sabotage and really wanna prevent us, the, the crab in the bucket syndrome, we understood exactly what we were dealing with. So once we understood, intentionally trying to do things to prevent us from having success, then we say, oh, here's another example. We're going to prove them wrong. And Sean and I, we used to sit and talk for hours every day, you know, and anytime we had a conflict, we bounced our ideas and our feelings off each other, and we came out alive. We came out without any physical injuries. We came out successful. We came out smiling, you know? So it's just a matter of learning that we had flawed thinking and correcting those thinking processes. And sounds like a lot of empathy gets developed through that process too. Well, you learn that in the victim awareness classes. You learn that when we're going through all these self-help groups that you have to put yourself in other people's shoes. Right. What Can you explain that expression you used, crab in the bucket? Well, the crabs in the bucket is, if you have 10 crabs in the bucket, if one crawls to the top, the other nine will get on top of each other to pull him down, They'll all be in the same bucket. What was the key role in your being free to? I would have to say my key role in being free was learning to change my thinking. And I keep harping back on this yes. because my, my thinking took me down so many destructive roads. And so my key role was to learn how to change that. And once I learned, once I gave myself a new pathway through my brain, because I had a bike trail through my brain, right? That bike trail was destructive going across that field. And so what I started doing is learning how to walk down the sidewalk to go around the block to get to the store, right? Instead of cutting across, which I was cutting life, right? Trying to do the shortcut, which was doing everything in the criminal activity world. And so once I learned that it was okay to walk around the block and that it was beautiful houses and people and dogs and everything, which I mean, life seemed better. Learning how to walk around and changing my way of thinking because it didn't bring upon so much stress. Like laying up in, at nighttime thinking about a man who I felt offended me and I'm up all night. 
thinking about him. And I'm playing, I'm role playing these, these actions that I should have did at the time, right? Or what I'm going to do when I push up on him and talk to him, right? And so that was stressful. And so when I learned and realized that, hey, like, wow, this really feels good that I can lay down at night and actually get some sleep. And so that was for me, my, my thinking. And for me, it was my religious belief. That was my foundation that kept me solid and surrounding people around me who held me accountable as I held them accountable. So I can't just say one specific thing because they're all connected together, right? Like the thinking could not work without what well, my creator, right? Was first and then it came my thinking and then it came the people that was around me. All three of them meshed together. And so without them, I wouldn't be sitting here today. But I think that thinking for me and speaking a lot with and trying to counsel clients to approach their program in a different way, I do. The thinking is the biggest roadblock that I have. And if they're not able to, like you said, just want to, want to think differently or have the courage to think differently, I can't get past that. But I can plant seeds. And I think that thinking, that is very, very powerful. And however you, you know, however you get there, either through religious beliefs, the programs, the positive people around you the saying, no, let's do this. Let's be the crabs that pull each other up over the bucket, not back down. I think that's really right. fantastic. Um, what about you, Daryl? Do you and think another, that? Oh, go ahead. Another, one more. One more before you go to Daryl. Another two more things. Another thing, as I started learning, the groups helped me also. But as I was going to the groups, more importantly, as I grew up, and started understanding things, that empathy of taking Mr. William Thomas's life, for me to engage in that behavior is re-victimizing him and his family. And so understanding that and then having someone, losing someone in my family and then experiencing that personally and then seeing them do the behavior was re-victimizing my family and, and me. And, and so I seen that. And so I feel like that, Though my crime was a horrible, horrible crime, I was given another opportunity to be better in life. And so I needed to take that and honor that, uh, honor my victim in that. And so once I started honoring my victim in my actions, right, that stops me from wanting to do a lot of things because it's like, man, you did this to this man, Mr. William, and here it is, you over here engaging in this behavior. Like, that's not empathy. Like you haven't really changed inside until you start thinking about the, the damage and the hurt that you caused. And so that is another big thing that stops me and motivates me and wants, helps me to continue to grow and change and help other people is remembering that, hey, this tragedy happened, but I was given another chance. And so I need to do the best that I can, right, to honor Mr. William Thomas. Daryl, how about you? If it's not just one big thing, or if there is one big thing, I think uh, as Sean was mentioning, and again, you know, we're on the same page, one hundred percent. So he says a lot of things that I would want, I wanted to say, but <laughs> the biggest thing for me was identifying who I was at the time that I committed my crime, and identifying who I was at the time that I was telling the board I was somebody different. I was young again because I was a I was convicted as a Jew. I was a juvenile when my crime was committed. I was 17 years old. And I had to come to grips with the fact that I was very self-centered. I was a selfish, that I was immature, that I had been, I was detached from my emotions, lived a lifestyle amongst people who had reduced expectations of themselves. So it was really easy for me to live like that when everyone thought we were gonna die in prison. Everybody thought we were never gonna get out. So everybody just did whatever they wanted to do. But once I saw that there was a, a, a different perspective and not only that the laws were changing, but I wanted something different in myself. And like Sean mentioned earlier, we didn't know, we didn't have the tools to get out. We wanted to get out. And we were going to the board and we were telling them we were changed people. We were going to groups. We were trying our best to stay out of trouble, which is, which is not very easy in prison. I have to say this, but we didn't have these tools like identifying our character defects or how uh, not understanding how our character defects as a young person developed into our causative factors to create these crimes. We didn't know this stuff. So we couldn't positively tell you, 
I I was immature, but now I'm mature. We didn't understand impulsivity. And now, I'm, I, and now I, I no longer, I think about the consequences before my actions. I mean, there were certain things that we didn't have a clue. So once I developed this understanding, as well as Sean and many other people like ourselves, these are the key roles to get us out of prison because the board said, now you're human. We became human again when we were able to identify our exactly. human emotions and characteristics. And this you is know, how you get out of prison. And what was the one thing you miss about prison? And Sean had kind of brought that up. I was surprised to be really honest that that, that was a topic of interest. And I also thought that it had a component of self-awareness in that idea. And so I was, uh, why don't I start with you, Sean? I like that question. That One question. of the things I really miss <laughs> about in prison, uh, me and, me and Daryl were, uh, we were facilitators in there. As, as men who had started, had changed their life, uh, we had a lot of people who, who looked to us for help. I miss being used and I use that word big, being used to help someone see life in a different way. I miss standing in front of a group and uh, teaching, and not just me teaching them something, but me also learning from them. That, like standing in front of the group, like if I had a bad day, when I get in front of the group and start facilitating, like everything left, like I just went to a whole nother world. And so um, I miss being used to help people because I love helping people. And, 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 and you'll hear it from a lot of men that once they change their lives, like they just want to give, they want to help. I miss the camaraderie that me and Daryl used to have. We still have our talks, but it was just something that we had in there, especially on Saturdays at work. You know, we would eat and, and just sit there and it was, it was, it was grown man talk day. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have that out here. It was just something really more special in prison. But that's what I miss. I miss uh, being used to help people and people coming to me. I mean, they're coming out here, but, you know, it's, it's a big difference. As they get to know me out here, then it's going to happen. But, yeah, that's what I miss. I miss helping people in there. And I feel like I left them, but I haven't. I miss the good guys that was in there changing their lives. And even the guys that wasn't, just to be able to have a – a, a, a positive conversation with him and give him a seed planted into him. It might not grow that day, the next week, month, year, two, three years mm -hmm. later. But as long as I know that seed was planted, I miss doing that. I miss being on the yard doing that. Now we're just on a bigger yard. That's awesome. How about you, Daryl? <laughs> what do you miss? Um, I'm just surprised. I'm like, you've missed something. But yeah, it's a good topic. I, I got to a point in my life where I believe that I overcame my old lifestyle. And it used to really disappoint me or hurt me when I seen people who had the opportunity to make the same change and, and refuse to. I miss now looking at the gentlemen that we left behind who we know need, do I know, need help, need an understanding, and need a, need a way out of their malicious way of thinking. And I don't know if they're receiving it, you know? And I mean, because a lot of brilliant, great men in prison. And I want the families also to know that just because of the, their loved ones in prison doesn't mean that they that they can't recover and become better people because it's not hard. But I miss not being able to be accessible every single day to the people who I long to see a smile on their face. Because in, in this world, I mean, you don't get to see, see people being free. Um, you know, I don't have the intimate details of who people are. You don't really know what they're going through because it's a hustle and bustle world out here. So, but inside, you get to learn people for who they are, and people were they were yes. forthcoming with their with their with their feelings and their emotions. And we were able to just communicate, and it's not always about helping. Sometimes just listening, and I, I miss yes. being able to listen to people, you know, just to just to make their day better. Because sometimes they just want to they want to be heard. I, I I miss that tremendously, and that's helping. Absolutely. I think the biggest takeaway for me from the discussion with Sean and Daryl is that. This is exactly how they communicated with the commissioners at their parole hearings when they were granted parole. They were not scripted for my interview, just as they were not scripted for their meeting with the commissioners at their parole hearing. They learned to have a conversation with the panel about who they were when they came to prison and who they are now. 
They were granted parole by becoming the men they wanted to be when they were released. Another important takeaway from our conversation today was the fact that it is not easy to get out of prison after receiving a life sentence, but it is entirely possible with hard work and a willingness to change. There is also a deeper message here for anyone struggling with finding the courage to heal and change. That's all I have for this week, and I hope 